Section 1. In this section, you'll hear a conversation between two students in the dining hall of the college. First, you have some time to read questions 1 to 4. Now listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions one to four. Hi, Max. How are you? Hi, Melanie. I'm fine. In fact, I'm preparing the coming holidays and I want to have a car tour with my friends. That sounds lovely. How is your preparation? Well, I haven't begun yet because I'm not quite sure how to rent a car and what the expense is like and something like this. Ha! <laughs> You've run into the right person. I did the same last holiday, and I can recommend it to you. I went to Avis Rent-A-Car Company, which is at 14A Dover Road, Oxford. Let me write it down. Is it D-O-V-E-R? Yes, and the telephone number is 6340963. But if you book for the first time, dial another number with extension. That is 6340853. Extension 54. OK, thank you very much. I'll have a try. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to read questions 5 to 10. Now listen to the conversation between Max and the assistant and answer questions 5 to 10. Good morning, Avis Rent-A-Car Company. How can I help you? Hi, I want to book a car for tour. I want to inquire some information about the grade of the cars and the prices. No problem. We offer a wide selection of rental cars to choose from, from luxury car to economy car, compact car, minivan and pickup truck. Well, a uh, luxury car is obviously out of my price range, but compact or economy is not big enough. You know, we have seven persons together. Well, how about a minivan? It's perfect for road trips and will make your journey feel like you're in a living room on wheels. I think that's good. Well, what does it feature? I, I mean, what facilities does it have? Unlike most minivans with manual transmission, the rental minivan cars have feature automatic transmission, air conditioning and AM-FM stereo. If you drive a long, smooth way, you can use the cruise control, which will save you a lot of energy. Good. How much is the price? If you rent an intermediate one, it will cost you £55 each day. If it is standard, the cost is £45 per day. I think the standard is enough. Oh, we have a special 50% discount for weekends, from Friday to Sunday. But that doesn't apply to tax, recovery fees and optional services. Well, what are the optional services? Well, they usually include some extra facilities, like first aid kit or something like that. Uh, I know. We plan to start off on Friday, so we have to prepare one day in advance. I want to book from 30th of April, which is Thursday. And it will end next Monday. OK. Could you leave your name and the driving licence number? My name is Max, and the licence number is M9021. OK. You can pick up the car on Thursday noon. Besides, we offer some optional services like street maps, flashlight and sunsheet. What would you like to have? Mm, flashlight is not necessary, I think. But street maps are useful, especially when we drive in a strange place. As for the sun sheet, I'd like to give that a miss. We don't want to spend too much extra money.
Okay, Mr. Max, thank you for calling. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 2. You will hear a library assistant talking about the library she works in. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 11 to 15. Hi, can I help you? Um, yes. I wanted to join the library. OK. First of all, let me show you around the library and explain a few things for you. OK. Now we're here at the main entrance. You can see the reception, which is where you bring back and take out books. And also, we can order books and answer your questions there. Mm -hmm. Next to the reception, where you can see those old desks, is where we keep the magazines, because you can sit down and read there. They're divided into sections for sciences, geography, arts, etc. Then, at the back of the library, you can see the section for old books. Next to that is where the books proper start. That used to be the science section. But now, on those shelves, you'll find the art section. We had a big reorganisation in the summer, which I think has made it clearer. Oh. <laughs> the numbering is standard, so you should be able to find what you want quite easily. However, if you can't find something, it probably means it's been borrowed. OK, then in the corner, next to the reference section, is where we thought it was quietest and away from the phones and printers and things, so we've put the study desks there. They all have computer access if you need it for your laptop. No. We do ask that you don't just read magazines there, though. OK, uh, then there's the reference section where you can look up the files. Then, as we come back to the main entrance, is the next section, where we used to have the languages. It got very busy and noisy, so when we moved everything round, we decided to put the law books here. Also, because it's a smaller section, it fits quite well here. Ah. OK, then, we're back at the main entrance. Over there, by reception, there's a door that goes to the extension. And we have further sections, such as languages and study desks through there. So you could have a look round when we've finished. Then, just between reception and the door here, is where we decided to put the computers. But the computer magazines are in the magazine section, as we found too many went missing here. <laughs> OK, is that everything? You now have 30 seconds to read questions 16 to 20. That's great, thanks. Can you just tell me a bit about borrowing and the rules and whatever? Of course. Over the last two months, we've been introducing a new system for this, and you can now take books out for six weeks. 
That's generally enough for most people. We usually get books back within 30 days. Of course, you may decide to renew the period. You used to have to come in to get the book stamped because we don't like doing it over the phone as there's no record of it. But now you can do all that via email. Oh. If you do forget to renew, then we do make a charge, I'm afraid. That helps our costs, of course, but we do insist on it. The good news is that there is only one charge. I know some libraries charge one pound for one week and then it goes up with each week it's late. We ask for one pound fifty, as we think that's high enough to stop people being overdue. <laughs> The other thing you may want to know is what you do about books that are not on the shelves. We do have a system for reserving them. All you have to do is fill in a yellow form behind those blue ones on the desk mm -hmm. and give it to someone at reception. We'll let you know when it comes in. Also, sometimes you will need a journal article that we don't have but can get from other libraries. So we offer an ordering service if you need it. Now, if you'd like to fill in this form here... Now turn to section 3 on page 69. Section 3. You will hear two university students, Phil and Stella, talking to their tutor about their research project. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 27 on pages 69 and 70. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 27. Come in. Ah, yes, Stella. Is Phil there too? Mm -hmm. Good. Come on in. OK, so you're here to discuss your research project. Have you decided what to focus on? You were thinking of something about the causes of mood changes, weren't you? Yes, but the last time we saw you, you suggested we narrowed it down to either the effects of weather or urban environment. So we've decided to focus on the effects of weather. Right, that's more manageable. So your goal is, uh, Phil? To prove the hypothesis, no, to investigate the hypothesis that the weather has an effect on a person's mood. Hmm, good. And uh, what's your thesis, Stella? Well, our thesis is that in general, when the weather's good, it has a positive effect on a person's mood, and bad weather has a negative effect. Hmm. Uh, can you define your terms here? For example, what do you mean by good and bad? OK. Well, good would be sunny, warm weather, and bad would be when it's cold and cloudy or raining. And how would you define an effect on a person's mood? What would you be looking to find? An effect on the way a person feels. Mm. Uh, a change in the way they feel, um, like from feeling happy and optimistic to sad and depressed. Right. And what sort of weather variables will you be looking at? Oh, sunshine, temperature, cloudiness, precipitation, among others. It'll depend a bit what the weather's like when we do the survey. Fine. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. But first, what about background reading? I gave you some suggestions. Did you manage to read any of it? Yes. We read the Ross Vickers article, the one comparing the groups of American Marines training in summer and winter. Hmm. That's quite relevant to our study. 
It was interesting because the Marines who were training in the cold winter conditions tried to cheer themselves up by thinking of warm places, but it didn't really work. Yes, they were trying to force themselves to have a positive mental outlook, but in fact it had the opposite effect, and they ended up in a very negative state of mind. And we found some more research by someone who wasn't on the reading list you gave us, George Whitebourne. He compared people living in three countries with very different climatic conditions. Actually, he looked at several things, not just the weather. But he found some people's reactions to bad weather were much worse than others, and it was linked to how stressed they were generally. Uh, the weather on its own didn't have such a significant effect on mood. And we looked at a paper by Haver... Haverton. Yeah. He broke weather up into about 15 or 16 categories and did qualitative and quantitative research. He found that humans respond to conditions in the weather with immediate responses, such as fear or amazement. But these responses can also be linked to associations from their earlier life, such as a particular happy or sad event. Uh, did you have a look at Stanfield's work? Yes. It was interesting because the type of questions he asked was similar to what we were planning to use in our survey. Yes. He asked people how they were feeling on days with good and bad weather. He found the biggest factor seemed to be the humidity. Moods were most negative on days with a lot of rainfall. Long periods without sunshine had some effect, but nothing like as much. Hmm. That could be quite a useful model for your project. Yes, we thought so too although we can't continue our survey for as long as he did. He did his over a six-month period. You now have some time to look at questions 28 to 30 on page 70. Now listen and answer questions 28 to 30. Right. Well, you've made quite a good start. Uh, so, where are you going from here? Well, we've already made the questionnaire we're going to use for the survey. It's quite short, just eight questions. We're aiming to survey 20 people over a period of three months from October to December. We can't specify the actual dates yet because it depends on the weather. We want to do the survey on days with a range of different weather conditions. And we'll just be working on campus, so our data will only be statistically sound for the student population here. That's OK. Have you thought how you'll determine what will constitute each aspect of weather? And how many you're looking at? We decided on four. The amount of sunshine, cloudiness, temperature and precipitation. We thought we might use the internet to get data on weather conditions on the days we do the survey, but we haven't found the information we need, so we might have to measure it ourselves. We'll see. Then we've got to analyse the results, and we'll do that using a spreadsheet, giving numeric values to answers. And then, of course, we have to present our findings to the class, and we want to make it quite an interactive session. We want to involve the class in some way in the presentation, maybe by trying to create different climatic conditions in the classroom, <laughs> but we're still thinking about it. I see. Well, that sounds as if you're on the right lines. Now, what I'd suggest that you think about, in addition to the work... We've... That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4. In this section, you'll hear a lecture about searching on the Internet. Now you have half a minute to read questions 30 to 40.
Listen to the tape carefully and answer questions 11 to 20. Morning, everyone. I think all of you are so familiar with the use of the Internet. After email, it's likely that the most frequent online activity is searching. For better or worse, the days of thumbing through pages of a dictionary, looking up in an encyclopedia for information are out of date. It's so much easier to just Google it. First, do you know how Google works and search what you're looking for? To start with, Spider Software, a module in the search engine, crawls web, finds, fetches pages, and follows links to other pages. Then, Indexer sorts words on every page Spider finds and stores an index of words in a huge database. For example, when you submit a query as Mount Everest, the search engine checks index and gets each page that contains Mount Everest. It stores pages using PageBank and decides which are likely to be most valuable. Usually, the most relevant pages are returned first. You can see that Google is not the only search utility in town, but it comes with such a formidable collection of tools to focus your search on that it is the engine of choice for many of us. The trick to efficient Google searches is mastering its tools to get what you want faster and more easily. Following are nine tricks to do just that. At first, you should know how to find similar terms. You thought the tilde character served no useful purpose, didn't you? But when you insert the tilde in front of a search term, Google will retrieve sources matching the word as well as synonyms. Do not leave a space between the tilde and the search term. Then, do you know how to exclude terms? It's also as important a trick as finding terms. Sometimes a keyword will come up with items totally unrelated to the subject you're interested in. For example, when you research plasma in the cosmos, you would type in the word plasma and be forced to wade through plenty of sites referring to plasma televisions. The fastest way to solve this is to use the exclude function, the hyphen. Type plasma hyphen TV, that is P-L-A-S-M-A hyphen TV, and you will eliminate many irrelevant sites. Are you usually made fun of by friends about your poor memory? Don't worry. They exaggerate. Sometimes you need to look up a quotation for which you can't recall all the words. No problem. Use asterisks to stand in for missing words. Sometimes when you translate or compose essays, you need to know the synonyms at a large scale. Of course, Webster Dictionary helps you efficiently, but you can now get definitions in a flash by typing define and your search word. You'll come up with definitions, synonyms, and links for further information. Now, how to find lost pages. A wonderful feature of Google Search is the cache option. In virtually all search results, you will see a link to cached versions of pages you're looking for. You usually won't need to refer to these archival pages, but if your search ever turns up an old news page, for instance, you may find that when you click on the link, the page no longer exists, even though it turned up in the search results. In that event, simply click on the cache link, which is at the bottom line of the search result, and that will retrieve the last saved version of the page that had failed to show. This is a powerful, extremely helpful tool when you come across old pages from websites that no longer exist or are no longer maintained. Do you want to get numbers or names? Looking up a phone number? Just type the name and city or state initials of the person whose number you're looking for. The number will pop up instantly. If you have a phone number but want the name or the location, just type in the number, no hyphens, parenthesis, or space necessary. For fun, type in 202-456-1111 and see whose office this number belongs to. Did you know you can search for pictures with Google? Just go to the Google homepage, click on Images, and type in what you're looking for. You can narrow your searches using the advanced search function to, for example, retrieve certain types or sizes of files. Finally, you can simplify all your searches by uniting the Google search bar into your browser.
Go to google.com, click More, scroll down the page to Google Tools, then click on Toolbar and follow directions from there. And of course, some of these tools will work with other search engines too. Experiment and see which ones work best for you. You'll find a wonderful world, I'm sure. That is the end of section four.